And thank you very much for being with me. <laughs> yeah, um, so I looked at your website. Your website is very impressive. <laughs> so what do you, you got? Like a like a five thousand people in your company? And no, no, no. <laughs> we're, just, we're just a small company. Um, we're based in Italy, um, and we we created this methodology uh, that I I produce. It's called Lean Presentation Design. And uh, I took what, the first book that I read. Uh, it was, and I still have it. The original version I have is a book that you should probably know. <laughs> oh, I, I I've seen it before. <laughs> the second edition, yeah. That is the second edition. Yes, um, I got it when uh, when I used to work in a co for a company. I was to you mm -hmm. to work for a multinational company in marketing, and I realized that basically everybody spends like all day making presentations. And uh, you have no time and you have to make them effective because mm. um, they impact on decision. And therefore uh, I got so passionate about this. I said, okay, I have to start from the, uh, from the best book I can find. And I, can, I, I have to learn everything I can about this topic. And the first book was Presentation Zen. I got so inspired by this concept of Zen simplicity because this was really needed. Yeah, I mean, the, the simplicity is, uh, the, the key thing is that simple isn't easy. So sometimes, well, software companies try to sell the idea to make it easy for you. But in some of the Zen arts that I've studied, like Sumie or the tea ceremony, it's called Sado. It's, it's never about making things easy for the creator. I mean, it's hard to be simple, but we want to make it simple, to simple for the audience. And, you know, that's true with customers too and communications or any kind of whatever the product it's hard to make good products or services but we want to make things easy for the the customer it's easy to be complicated <laughs> in, in communications too if you just wing it for example or if you just throw everything in including the kitchen sink um, <laughs> we do that in japan a lot we say nen no tameni, which is just well to be safe just to be safe let's put more information <laughs> <laughs> in the slide and every just <laughs> becomes a mess so it takes courage to be simple you know to leave out what is what you think is not necessary in the moment it it, it, it does take courage to be simple i think especially um when you face an audience and uh, you might not remember well you fear maybe you 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 will go black out during the presentation you might not know what you're going to have uh, <laughs> To say and therefore yeah. people say okay i will put everything so i can read but then we say okay we don't want people to read and then uh, we we shouldn't be reading in front of our audiences right mm. yeah well i mean i i started this i mean after i left apple then i mean i left to become a college professor so there i'm lecturing and i did kind of start with simple but you know beautiful slides the apple way but probably more bullet points than i would ever use and but eventually i got rid of that because oh well, i know what i'm talking about i'm not going to forget that's just another slide with a key point on the slide whatever i don't need because i can just see eyes glaze over when and, and that was the worst part of a steve jobs presentation too back in the day if he would do do a slide with like six key points like a summary you know where he'd have six bullets and that was like the worst the lowest part <laughs> it was like okay that's we don't need that. So, but you know, I use lots of data, you know, data visualization mm. in presentations, and that's that's never boring. I uh, yes, please go ahead. No, I mean it's just that, especially over here, we put instead of having one good bar chart, and then another line chart or something in the next slide, we'll put five or six charts in one slide, <laughs> with lots of text to explain. It. And like, well, what is that? Rather than just. <laughs> you know, telling a story and going step by step through something. If it's a present, if a presentation is warranted, usually most cases it would be better to not have a presentation and just have a handout around a table with 10 people. But if it's a big thing like a keynote, that's a that's a different thing. But the problem is still in, in companies, there'll be say 10 people in a meeting or 20 people mm -hmm. and it's it'll be a presentation with a lot of slides. And that just doesn't seem like the appropriate place. We could just have a discussion. Right. Or send or make a video. This is the more modern thing. Make a video, a proper presentation, you know, a few days before or whatever, and then have people watch that and then come prepared to discuss at the meeting where the person can review or get to the whiteboard and write some things down. But just listening to a TED talk inside the company, a TED TED like talk inside mm -hmm. the company is like, is this a good use of time? You should have made a video of that and then we can I can watch that. And then we can talk about it because we want to anytime you just have people listening 
it's not a really good use of a meeting, I think. There should be discussion. The, 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 I, I believe that the value of having people uh, gathering together, it's, uh, it, it comes from the dialogue, right? Uh, as a discussion. Uh, at the end of the day, I believe a successful presentation is when uh, the, 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 the presenter is able to share some food for thought, some ideas, uh, mm -hmm. take people from a story, maybe inspire them, and then uh, trigger a discussion that might lead... Um, to a decision making, taking a strategic mm. decision, leading the business, and therefore uh, we use data to validate our assumptions and our proposals. But at the end of the day, uh, I believe a presentation should be uh, the the opportunity to create a conversation with the audience. Yeah, sure. No, absolutely. So when I hear people complaining about PowerPoint, so we're going to ban PowerPoint, it, it's not about the tool. It's it's just a way of it's a way of thinking. It's a very old way. Well, it started, I guess, in the eight, sort of 80s, very 80s way or 90s way of putting together a deck and then going to a meeting and going through the deck. And yeah. It's just a really old fashioned way of doing it. So a lot of companies did away with it, but it's not the fault of PowerPoint. You know, so some companies will have something like make a one page document and send that around, which forces you to be simple and cram everything into one page maybe uh, but then we read it you make your case and then in the meeting we can discuss and review and you might show a few key um, slides with some data on it but basically it's just something for a discussion because often in presentations there's no discussion there's the data it's like blah, 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 blah. even if it's a great visual even if oh that's a perfect you know data visualization but we should talk about <laughs> more what it means and is it is it accurate is it true and is it like, there it goes <laughs> my students do that all the time like whoa there you just went that was a lot of data there and you just went right by that <laughs> I, I think uh, I think that very often this happens because first first of all it's easier because doing what we are talking about here coming to a presentation prepared takes you takes you to spend time and get really prepared um, to study before. Uh, one of the things that I see most very often presenters come to presentation, they are not really prepared. Um, so <laughs> rehearsing, I think, uh, not, not, I mean, we don't need to learn the presentation by heart in my opinion, mm. but just knowing where you want to start, what is your goal? Um, I like you say, uh, you always have to know what uh, uh, what is your point and why it should care. I think there is a, um, there is a Japanese word for that. Um, oh, my... the dakaranani. Yeah, I don't know. Yes. I mean, that is Japanese language. Dakaranani just, it's not very polite language. It just means, so what? <laughs> so you might, actually, I don't even really hear that in general conversation. But anyway, it, it's just it's like, what? Like, what does that mean? Or what do you mean? So it's just something when I was learning Japanese, I, I remember that phrase. So I always ask <laughs> myself, so, so what? What is it? Everything you put, just like in filmmaking, you're right, you might have a beautiful scene like, oh, this took a million dollars to produce and blah, blah, blah. But it doesn't really push the story forward. So you got to cut it. So yeah. kind of same idea. At the end of the day in the presentation, I, I believe we are, um, we, the moment we start talking, we, uh, we already own our audience their time. At the end of the day, we, uh, uh, we need their time, we need their attention, which basically are two of the scarcest resources we have as humankind. And I believe that also if, I mean, the, the commitment that we ask every time we start the presentation is huge to people. Um, we really need their focus, their time. And by the way, nobody's going to give back their time. After yeah, the it's, it's really precious. The uh, CEO, Phil, uh, what's his last name? Sorry. Oh, it's late. That's my excuse. Anyway, Phil is the CEO, <laughs> founder of uh, mm -hmm, the, you know, the, this kind of interesting software. Um, okay. for online presentations. You've heard it, right? M-M-H. Well, mm-hmm. <laughs> okay. Anyway, he did his presentation recently where he talks about the future of, you know, presenting. It's like a, a pyramid. So, um, of course, the, the most precious, as you just said, is the people's time. So when we're face-to-face -face in a room, that is really precious. And that's really not a good time to have those, say, 20 people just listening to someone talk, right? It, we should have a discussion. And yeah. then there's live Zoom, meet, like Zoom meetings. But even then, again, if why are people just like 20 screens or 20 you know, videos rather, and people are just 
their, their lips aren't moving. One person, is, his lips are moving. That's not really a good, that could have been a video. <laughs> so he showed in the pyramid, like 60% of presentations in the future, or well now, should be, you know, online. And of course you could use mm-hmm or OBS. Mm-hmm makes it easy. You could use OBS or Zoom or whatever, <laughs> but make really good presentations, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, whatever, and just upload them to this wherever in your company. Or, watch that watch that presentation but then when we come together that is precious so he used lord of the rings remember precious my precious lord of the rings you have to be kind of a nerd i don't know if you watch that Gollum. i love that but pre <laughs> face to face is really precious and we just cannot waste people's time i mean work life is hard enough <laughs> so <laughs> we should never be wasting it in meetings unless we're talking i mean if we're talking if everyone's talking and contributing that's much more interesting than just listening to someone well, what do you think then is the role of a presentation nowadays yeah i think it's really it's really changing so i like this thing that phil said i i think there's going to be a lot more skill necessary for for all, for all of us or all of us won't do it but it you can set yourself apart, obviously, if you're a good presenter and the way you can produce good visuals and stand and deliver, of course, with visuals, but also the ability to do that online and to hold people's attention in online type of meetings and have the, enough sophistication to get a good microphone and a good camera and, and all that kind of stuff. But also a little bit of uh, filmmaking. You don't have to be a great, you know, uh, George Lucas or something, but <laughs> to just know the basics of how to use, I mean, even just your smart, this is a great camera, even an old iPhone 11 or whatever this is, but it's amazing compared to what our parents had and grandparents or my grandparents had an eight millimeter, but that, you know, that they didn't make <laughs> movies with that. We should learn how to make short, you know, good movies about whatever it is. I mean, we could be in architecture or uh, city city develop planning or something we could make important videos in for internal use or external but the ability to make those at a pretty high level i think that's going to be an important skill we'll always have of course professional filmmakers that don't, that's not going away but i think the general skill level of everyone should should go up a little bit just like with presentations um, I, I, and I think that it doesn't take too much uh, to become to 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 really step up the quality of the mm -hmm. delivery, especially when we deliver online. As you said, everybody uh, likely has a as a smartphone, uh, whether that is an iPhone or whatever other smartphone. When you when you get the back camera, it's it's amazing. You have three apps that can convert that camera into a webcam, yeah. and you can use it. Um, there are there is plenty and. And uh, I always talk about them. Oh, yeah. Even this is better than the web camera, which is, you know, on which I'm not using, but which is awful, <laughs> which is just garbage. It's so bad if I switch to that. I mean, this is bad enough because I can't, I just can't, I don't know. You look great. I mean, your skin is all soft and your, the lighting, I look, you got that nice diffused lighting from the window. It is and, the um, window. The window is magic, but it's also the place. Um, I mean, on an island where the where the light, uh, the daylight is. Just Wait, where are you? Where are you? Are you in Italy now? I'm not in Italy right now. I'm in a in a Spanish island island uh, called Fuerteventura. It's in Canary Oh, Islands. it's close to Africa. Well, is this vacation or this is where you work? Well, I I I used to work from here um, <laughs> for a good part of the year because I'm passionate about kite surfing. <laughs> ah, you mean the kind that takes you up where you can like really go? It's yeah, where you have the kite uh, and you have the yeah. board, and uh, the the kite brings you with the wind. Uh, yeah, but I've seen some people go up. It seems like fifty meters or so. I mean, uh, well, <laughs> I I wish <laughs> I could jump so high. <laughs> wow, but that's yeah. great. So you're really you you are really embracing then what the company mm -hmm is always talking about because they don't talk about their software so much they talk about this evolution or this revolution i guess of you know working from home that that's not or working from wherever you remote working hmm. that we don't have to come to you know some things obviously if you're a doctor although even doctors are performing surgery a friend of mine is one of the leaders in that they're performing surgery from different countries live because there's these things that, that you can do now. Oh, yes. But anyway, a lot of work is going to be remote. Is going to continue to be remote. I mean, why not? They don't even. I don't think we'll call it remote working. We'll just. Some people will be in the office, and other people will be in Spain. So, and that's okay. Look, look. I I believe the biggest challenge is company culture. 
um, yeah. how, and this is one of the challenges I think we have to, we will have to face with this revolution of work because uh, I mean, um, one thing is spending time with your colleagues, um, so soft time, like coffee yeah. break, having lunch with them, uh, and you shift to the point in which your time for the others, for colleagues is just uh, a slot on your calendar. You connect and you disconnect and you move to the next meeting. And then how do you build um, a, f- a feel of belonging, right? Uh, how do you build a company culture? Um, and I, I think um, in, in this sense, um, this this will be this will be this will be a big a big challenge, especially for those who are joining maybe a company now, mm-hmm. and they've never met their colleagues, right? Um, so uh, I don't know. Uh, this is um, but this is mostly a challenge I think for our students. I'm, I'm also uh, teaching at college. It's one of the parts that I I, I love at university. I I love I really love uh, uh, sharing uh, what I what I didn't have with my students. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and this is something we talk, we often talk about, what is it going to be afterwards, right? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I don't think, I think we're still in the middle of it and just COVID sort mm-hmm. of pushed us, but we're, it's not going back to the way before COVID, but it, we're, we're still in the transition. And of course people will resist it. People my age are going to resist it <laughs> and bosses. I mean, even Elon Musk, you know, whatever. But it, so a lot of people are re, resisting it um i don't know Uh, obviously this works for a lot of things but i do like it i like both because like with my class now so let's say i have a class meets twice a week i'm fine with once a week we can be online and once a week we can be in person definitely being in person and then then we kind of know each other we know how tall oh you're that you know you're 180 center okay we have this kind of a better feel for things so we need both of those things uh, but they're very different and present like presenting pre- pre- presenting online is uh, is very different than doing it you know in in the in the classroom how 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 different do you find it is well i mean i think it's you know the chat when again there's a cultural difference because you know we're in japan and in some ways it's better because for example now we don't wear masks online but in the classroom people are wearing masks so we all instantly already have better communication but you know that old john medina thing about the 10 minute rule where you have to change things every 10 minutes i think it's more like every two minutes or one minute so just a lot of variety so it's you know when, like when i was using mm-hmm, i really you know i i'm more like a tv studio but you have to get people involved you can do questions you could you know do quizzes sh- uh, show a short video ask questions of people at the thing is, in the classroom, even even if I have 20 students, it's hard to remember their names, at least for me. But the great thing about online is their names are all right there. So I actually have better interaction. And then I carry that into the classroom because now I've, I've kind of remembered their names. I associate the face with that. There's the Romaji. I mean, there's the, the name Romaji, sorry. The English letters, <laughs> you know, are under their face. So now I, that's actually an advantage. So anyway my long too long answer is you can edit this the long answer is uh yeah just even more 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 engagement more moving around which the the worst teachers uh never adopted to they still drone on for an hour lecturing and going through bulleted slides and then say at the end any questions i mean students have turned their cameras off and i don't even know if they're there (laughs) and again there's probably if you're gonna if you're gonna just lecture there's no there's no reason to do that live make a video of that it's not a great video and no one wants to watch it probably but at least they could watch it on their own time and skip through things and speed it up or whatever so yeah i just think in the classroom you've got to be doing stuff having a discussion and yeah, I, I uh, look, I, I, I agree. I definitely agree with you. I, I personally believe that um, very often uh, I get this question, what do you think? Is it better online? Is it better in presence? I think both uh, modes, they have pros and cons. I, I wouldn't say that one is absolutely better than the other. Of course, when you're live, uh, when you're in presence more than live, uh, then you, you have a different connection with people, uh, 100%. But I Online, as you said, the thing of the names is something that while, while giving trainings, uh, it's something that I appreciate a lot. But also the fact that, for example, people can record a session 
um, mm. I think it's it's precious to to my trainees. This is something that I of, often receive. Often um, people tell me, Maurizio, we love the fact that we can record the meeting and then we can rewatch it, stop it. And therefore, this is probably taking us to your conclusion, which would help to have a video as a prep material. Mm -hmm. so that people can get ready and then reserve the interaction reserve the, the live session to to the interaction mostly probably this is yeah, uh... yeah did you see the um, apple keynote I, I didn't watch all of it but i used to years ago even before i worked at apple i was always interested in their keynotes mm -hmm. and this time it, from what i and i haven't gone back but it looked like even live a lot of it was actually it was all um recorded but it was very smooth it was broadcast live but everything was i don't know if everything but a lot of it was pre-recorded but in a very smooth way not in the the old way it's like okay we got john in cairo okay ready go you know it's not like that it was so smooth if you weren't paying attention you wouldn't even know that it was not live but the old way of bringing someone on stage you know you knew that it was live yep I don't know. I, I think this is getting into the idea that if you're just going to do a present, not just, if you're going to do a presentation, you know, a high quality one, like, you know, Ted styled, a good one, good content, good visuals. Why not just record that? Uh, you could even do that in a live presentation. Like I'm live now and then click. I suddenly, <laughs> I keep going, but that's recorded or I'm going to play this and I'll be back in 10 minutes. But yeah, I just think that's the, that's the world of the future. As much as you can pre-record it, for people to watch whenever they can. And often we like watching it on the train, not while driving, mm -hmm. but a lot of countries, <laughs> it, you know, well, even New York City, where, you know, on the subway, you know, that's a time to consume content. Yes. I watch your video and I have some questions. Now let's discuss. Yes. Well, it's a, I would say it's time not to be wasted. Therefore, I immediately need to do. Uh, I think we're, we're also losing the, uh, the beauty of uh, spending some time doing nothing uh, well, because yeah. every time uh, every time we, we we feel like we're wasting time we need to connect immediately and and do something whether this is scrolling socials or uh, yeah. emails yeah th this is a whole other discussion so i'm not sure the purpose of this video now but <laughs> I, I wonder if if like in 10 well not 10 years maybe 20 years or something people will go like social media like remember when like our parents were into social media like god what a waste of time that was it because i'm looking at things like instagram my wife and everyone says you know get on instagram you got to do instagram instagram's all about this immediate short it's just like doing stuff like doing stupid pet tricks it's like do stuff to keep people engaged which has nothing to do with my i mean i'm not a celebrity i mean if you're the rock or you know if you're a celebrity then that's cool i want to see your you know whatever you do just <laughs> sylvester stallone can just go shopping okay that's cool but the rest of us aren't celebrities we should be producing something so youtube it seems viable to me you know you can really create something even if they're short videos but you've really cr created and curated something i don't anyway i just think I, I think people in the future are gonna think oh yeah grandparents with that social constant <laughs> stuff and how they were addicted to their screens and yeah well, well not, it doesn't seem sustainable are we gonna do this for, for the rest of our lives just be <laughs> Are we gonna keep well, doing no. this? <laughs> well, the the way our parents reacted about uh, um, about social media is the way probably we do react about when we hear about metaverse, right? So uh, <laughs> here we go. That is the reaction I was expecting. <laughs> I well, the metaverse, metaverse so called, might be a, a great thing, but the way they presented it was comic was awful. It was it was beyond awful. They should have got. Tom Cruise and Tom Hanks to do it rather than the nerdiest people in the world to like this no, <laughs> no not want to be in that room. <laughs> I even saw some presentations delivered <laughs> virtually, which I, is which is uh, I mean why? <laughs> I, yeah, I mean again they they have they done the fundamental thing. It's fundamental is you know why? I mean and they might have a good reason, but the presentation didn't it didn't answer that. Yeah, I mean, just because you can do something. Remember, like Google Glasses was that? Was it Google that had the glasses? Like that was it with the video glasses, and yeah. everyone kept getting beat up who was wearing them. Yeah. And <laughs> just because you can do it doesn't mean it's a good idea. No, exactly. So, and I think this should be a quote for presentations, generally speaking. <laughs> Whenever in 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 PowerPoint, just just because you can do something, this doesn't mean you should do this. 
<laughs> yeah, including the presentation itself. You might be a great presenter and a presentation master, but just because you can doesn't mean you should. This isn't the time for a presentation. <laughs> yeah, could be the title for your next book. I mean, you said I'm not a celebrity. I think you are a celebrity. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, everyone's a celebrity then. Oh, come I don't. On. I think Presentation Zen is one of the most inspiring books in our domain. Uh, I, I, what, what do you think? It, what do you think uh, made it so successful? Well, it was timing. You know, this was back. I started the blog, the website, and God, what was it? Two thousand five, something like that. Two thousand six, mm. and Ted was just getting started with online. They had everything, of course. They never put it online, and then it just hit a nerve. You know, I mean, I think. I touched on what everyone was thinking that this is kind of ridiculous and I'd always been interested in presentation I'm not a very flashy like I didn't want to be on TV or anything so I wasn't like that kind of person I, otherwise I would have majored in that I majored in philosophy not in communications but I had an interest in design and I did present in multimedia stuff in high school so I had an interest in that and the TV news I always liked TV news just the way they presented the weather and all of that and I always thought the PowerPoint slide should be like that. And then at, when I saw Apple, oh, long, gosh, I think it was just after Steve Jobs came back, so 97, and he was presenting in a very, a very visual way. This is the way it should be. But in the company, everything was just lines of text and stick, it? stick figures. You know, it, yeah, well, yeah, and in, in, in Sumitomo at my company. But I didn't uh, present that way. But I got, you know, my first Mac, well, the first um, like notebook, I don't know what it was, but something in the 90s, and then could try to, you know, use visuals, use photos. Wow, what a concept. I, mean, I remember putting like a photo and a big text and people are like, wow. <laughs> and they would say like, what software is that? And I, uh, it's PowerPoint. It's PowerPoint. <laughs> PowerPoint can do that? It was like a four, probably 480p picture or something <laughs> with some text and the and then a video, which is probably 240p video, <laughs> little thing. Oh, uh, I times. remember it was like Mission Impossible trailer, Mission Impossible Ooh. 2 or something. I don't know. Okay, which is a movie that I love. <laughs> yeah, and uh, and people are like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> and it was kind of like that in those days. You could just do, if you just did something that was a little bit different. Yeah, I... I, I saw your presentations and I, I, I love the, 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 the way you, uh, you make them effective, but you find the, the simplicity uh, behind um, and, and you find a, the, a simple way to communicate something that is always powerful for you. Make it, you really make the message sick. One of the things that uh, company people always tell me is, yeah, Maurizio, but I mean, um, I'm not Steve Jobs. I have to communicate data uh, and uh, I have plenty of bullets. I have plenty of messages. Yeah. Well, that's nonsense. You don't need the bullets. I mean, uh, Hans Rosling was a good example of someone with lots of data. So you can have lots of data. The, I mean, uh, business intelligence, you know, visualization of data is a big business now. Mm. That's good stuff. We need we need that. And you, you should never apologize for data. I hear some people saying like, oh, sorry, I got some charts to go through. No, that's a great opportunity. Charts are, are wonderful if they're done in an honest way. And, and you try to help people see the reality. I, again, I think honesty is very important because it's very easy to, <laughs> to lie and deceive with data. But if you approach it honestly, that, that, that's just, I mean, the idea that they would say, I have lots of data. Yeah, well, is it necessary for this presentation or how much could you cut? And if it's all necessary, well, then maybe you should write a book or put it in a document <laughs> and give people that document. And then you could just highlight a few things at the whiteboard or, I mean, each case is different, but uh, and I know they're busy, but you know, there's a lot of doctors. I hear from doctors all the time, medical professionals who are always presenting and they're really interested. I think because doctors are kind of like Renaissance people. They're scientists, but also artists, you know, it's a sort of a really a, a merging of the, you know, our doctors are kind of interesting yeah. because they're not, I mean, they are scientists, but not just hardcore in the lab scientists, but they have to deal with people and yeah. they often have to teach. They have to teach their colleagues, their younger colleagues, and they have to present at conferences and, and they know they're smart people. They know this is a waste of time. <laughs> if you're just going to go through this stuff, we should have a conversation and, you know, make it simple. doesn't mean dumb it down. 
it's hard to be it's hard to be simple get to the point show us the reality and then let's have a discussion yeah and tell, tell and tell us why we should care um yes, again, why should we care and i i think people are afraid to be simple because if you understand my idea then that's scary because that means you might disagree <laughs> you might shoot me down but if i just can you know make it complicated and run through it <laughs> that, that at least I can get off the stage without people asking hard questions. <laughs> yes, you get, get you get them confused with um, technical vocabulary. People don't really understand. They they think this guy must be. Yeah. <laughs> well, actually, I think this is not the way it goes. I think the way it goes is often no. Oh, I, I can't understand anything. Those lights are too complicated. He's pointing mm -hmm. back and forth with his laser pointer. I, I really <laughs> can't follow this dot. Yeah. Well, where is it? That that's well, I, that's really a pet. I hate the word pet peeve, but I don't know another expression. But the I, the pointer the pointer was not made for following bullet points. You know, there might be a time for it, like if you want to show where the tumor is on the X-ray, it's like right there, and then turn it off. Don't don't keep. Otherwise, dogs and cats are going to start attacking your screen. Uh, I yeah, and I think. Um, I think if you feel at any moment in time during a presentation, if you really feel you have to point something because people don't see don't see what you want them to see, I think you should rethink the slide, because uh, I believe that while you're giving a presentation, um, all you have to focus is on people is your right. focus should be people you we as presenters i believe we stand for the others we are successful if we are able to, to turn our spotlights onto mm. them if we stand for them if we can make the, them change evolve then uh, we are successful but then if we and therefore we have to focus on them all we have to do is click and the next slide should take them through the journey uh, with us. But uh, we should always each time know where they're looking in, in, in a slide. And uh, if we don't know, if we have to add some dots or other things mm. is because of slide, the experience on the slide is probably not yeah. conceived the right way. Right, we should anticipate that. Sometimes you might not, right, you should anticipate it. So you could have that animation come in later to, or a pointer or a highlighter, but there might be a case where um, yeah, something happened where it, someone has a question and then, then you could, but you're right. Generally, I mean, I never use a laser pointer. I mean, I never literally never use one. I don't, I have no need for that, but I could imagine, I mean, you could, I guess, point at something, but you would anticipate that. Or I often can just get, I mean, even on big stages, I've been able to just walk over there and point at it. I think, come on, I mean, it has to be reasonable. I mean, I'm not saying we shouldn't use it ever, but we shouldn't abuse uh, yeah. this kind of tools uh, because we should have a, a list of experience. I mean, uh, sometimes you have this, this, as you were saying, slides with full of data and you have these charts and then you realize how powerful it is sometimes when you, when you just gray everything column out and then you highlight just one column which is the number you want people to focus on. Sometimes just a little change of color, um, a little edit like that, a small edit like that can make a huge difference. Yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. So maybe the biggest proponent of laser pointers, I guess, are the people who make laser pointers. <laughs> I think they're used in soccer stadiums more often these days. <laughs> yeah, that is true as well. <laughs> not good. Do not do that. I'm May I ask you a question? I, I'm very curious about what do you, I mean, how did you come up with this idea of presentation then? Well, I mean, I live in Japan and so I've always been, well, I was interested in Japan before I moved to Japan. Mm. And I'd studied, I mean, just as a student, surface level studying some of the Zen, Zen arts like tea ceremony and a sumie, which is very similar. It's a kind of a it's a kind of a brush painting with uh, just different shades of black. It's the black ink. Ah, I see what you mean. On yeah. white paper. Mm -hmm. And um, it's something that looks easy because it's, but it isn't. It, and Ikebana, which is flower arrangement, arrangement, it's, it's of course beautiful to behold. Well, it's kind of like music in a way, like jazz. I mean, jazz, you might think, oh, this is, this is lovely. This is simple. Um, but it's hard to be simple. It takes a lot of training and I mean, even pop music. I, I recently have been again into the Beatles watching a documentary, which I loved. And it, there's simple things, even like the song Imagine, which is not the Beatles, obviously, but that's very simple four chords that you've heard a million times. It's a C, I think. So it's C, it's C and an F and a, 
what the hell, G, A, no, E minor, whatever. It's very simple four chords. And yet it's put together beautifully, but I don't say it's simple in the sense, well, this is idiotic. It's so simple. <laughs> it's not blues is like blues is three chords, but it's very deep in its simplicity. And anyway, a lot of the Zen arts um, are like that. They, it takes years and years and years of practice. It's not something you can just do. Same with the blues. You might think, oh, this seems simple. It's three chords, but yeah, okay. But there's a big difference between you and B.B. King. So it takes years to learn how to master those three chords and to yeah. learn how to use space and silence and tone and all these things. So it looks easy, but it isn't easy. But it takes years and years of study and practice to become that kind of to make it look easy, just like the Beatles with pop music, they what people forget is for like two years they were in Germany just hashing it out like eight hours a day in these clubs in Hamburg, right? And then through that hard work, wow, now we're we got it to where we don't even have to think about it. And a lot of you know arts are like that. You study and you study, and you think about it, and then after a while you don't have to think about it; you can just do it. But you had to practice like crazy to get to that. And I think I think uh, um, uh, I, I can see the connection that you that you found uh, between um, between these and presentations uh, and the need for simplicity. Um, though I, I I have a feeling that sometimes everybody is called to make effective presentations, uh, always in less time because we we need yeah. people to make better presentations, but we need them to make them in less time. They never have enough time, so there is this you know finding the sweet spot is not easy at all. Um, yeah, please go. Yeah, no, that, I mean that is the key word. The key word is you know you don't ask how many slides should I do I need or something like that. It's how much time do I have. And when is it that they say it's in two weeks and it's it's really important for whatever? Okay, I, I'm going to put a lot of effort into this and this is going to be amazing. But if you say it's tomorrow, then I have to say, okay, I'm going to, should I use slides? Maybe not. Maybe I'll just use a whiteboard or a handout. But let's say, okay, I am going to use a multimedia. We have this beautiful screen and there's 300 people coming. So this, it's going to, you know, I'm on stage, but I, I only have tonight to prepare it. So I'll just say, I'm going to make a, my own limitation. And so I'll just say, well, I don't usually, I don't need a number of slides, but I'll just say I might, because I do everything on paper first. So I just write, well, what is my key point? What am I going to do? I get it on paper. Okay. And then it might be 10 slides or 20 slides. But the key thing is I know I have three minutes. So, and you know, I, I can work that out. Um, just, so that's the key thing is when is it? And how much time do I have to prepare? And how long do I have to speak? And why am I speaking? That's it. it. You you can go, you can go without slides, but you cannot go without sure. the story. Exactly, exactly. I have to have a point. It can't go without <laughs> preparation. Some people can. I mean, some people say they can. I mean, some people, I guess, are good at winging it. Uh, I'm not. I did Toastmasters when I was younger too, and it always made me nervous because they'd have these pop things. I just, uh, <laughs> I mean, maybe it's not as bad. I mean, I feel it's awful. People never know that you're as nervous as you think you are. If you just slow down, but um, that's I, good training, I, by the way. I, I think that's that's the yeah that that was my point. Uh, I think everybody's called to do that nowadays, and it has a strong impact on you know your personal branding, the way you are perceived by the others, the impact you have on business. But at the end of the day, everybody's making presentation, but it's not it's not everybody's job. I mean, it's a skill that it's not just a side skill. Um, it's it takes time. To simplify, to get to 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 a presentation that really that really works. Um, I heard this thing um, that when you have like three minutes and you have to uh, get to the point, there are three things you have to remember, which is which are what, so what, now what. Yeah, that's I like that. Sure, <laughs> and and get to the point, and and it's true with YouTube videos too. That's why I want to really have a go at YouTube, and I would do it with no introduction. I hate. Since I'm in the education space, I hate the one, the title is like how to do whatever, how to do ABC. Okay, that, that's what I want to see. And it's like, hey guys, what's happening? And then it goes on and on. And, and then there's like a 10 second intro with a really <laughs> nicely produced, oh wait, I don't need that either. And then it's back, okay, let me tell you why ABC. ABC is really important to, oh God. <laughs> that drives me nuts. I lose my zen that completely. Me. 
<laughs> and I love the guys. And I see I see these people getting praised. I look in the comments when someone just gets right to the thing. It's like, whatever. I'm going to tell you whatever. I'm going to tell you how to put this thing into your iPhone. All right. Thanks for coming, guys. So here it is. And just, oh, wow, he's getting right to the point. That's great. Thank you. And this is this is uh, this is very interesting. But by the way, uh, I think uh, there is one thing that we were forgetting, which is and don't forget to eat the bell and follow me, uh, or uh, don't forget to. <laughs> I never. Give me the that's bell. the other thing I'm going to do. I'm going to be. I'm vowed to become a successful YouTuber, but I'm never going to say that. I've never said that in any of my videos. I'm, I do put a thing at the end, but I, I hate that because it's like. It's like meeting someone at a party and just like, you know, right away, here's my card, which we kind of do in Japan anyway. But I, and I hate it. I hate that thing at the parties. We call these um, Meishi exchange. Meishi means a business card. And the okay. Meishi exchange, you go to this party and you just give your business card to people. But it's sort of weird to me. But anyway, imagine in real life, it's like, hey, hey, I'm Gar. And uh, you know what? Don't forget to like. Could you go to my website right now and like? Could you like me and subscribe to my newsletter? <laughs> like get out of here what do you that's so rude. if i want i do that <laughs> yeah I don't but know. this is this is, i think this is a very interesting point because you know on one side you have storytellers who tell you that you have to start with the context and you have to introduce a conflict and therefore you have to talk about the problem and then you have to introduce a solution and this it is only between the problem and the solution that you can raise tension and therefore create attention but then you have other principles like pyramid principle or whatever it is called yeah. and they tell you go straight to the point and so which one is the right way? Yeah. No, I think, anyway, get to the point as straight as you can. So I like to start with a problem or, you know, some context, just like in movie making. But you need impact. Movies are like, I watch so many movies with my son all the time. We have a the like a home theater downstairs <laughs> since they were baby. I mean, we built this house. So I designed because I, I want my, I think my kids are either going to be, I've either ruined them or they're going to be filmmakers because we, <laughs> we watch a lot of movies. But, you know, even in a movie, you've got a two hour movie, boom, you got to start with something that brings them in. But there's also exposition, there's context also in the beginning. I mean, that, otherwise it doesn't mean anything. So what's the problem? You need to set the stage for the problem. So in our world of business, we have to get, you know, right away, we got to get to the problem. But you also, I mean, you could, I don't mean start with a joke, but you need something impactful. It could be data, mm -hmm. Like you see this number or, or tell a story. I remember the, this great presentation. I don't know if it's online anymore. It was a safety presentation about the importance of like not having junk around the helicopter pad on an oil platform, you know, oil platforms in the ocean, right? Yep. And you, you can't have like buckets or anything around the platform, but it happens sometimes. And he told a story of this happened. A helicopter landed and this bucket went flying from the, the what do they call it wake anyway the the air from the the rotors anyway it killed it killed this guy he told the story but he told it in a really dramatic but sincere way of how this guy let's say his name is steve and you know he lost his he's he died so his children he took, you know his children lost their father all because someone didn't follow the safety procedures to move this bucket now he said it in a way that it wasn't like that it wasn't um accusatory or it wasn't graphic in a way that was you know, over the top. It was really done in a, a great way, but it was a presentation about safety. He could have he could have just said, follow these procedures because if you don't, someone will get killed. He actually told the story of someone who did get killed. And I, I saw a poster once or a sign actually in Hawaii that that talked to, that showed the newspaper headlines of people who were killed. This is this is more sort of what's the word graphic or to the heart. They said stay away from this waterfall right when it's raining because okay. rocks might fall down. Okay. They say that warning everywhere, but they also put newspaper copies from the past of where people died because they they did it. You know, and that seems really graphic. And like, whoa, yeah. that's but yeah. that that got the point that it's not just a warning sign, but this is dramatic. So there's the story. There's human elements. I think at the end of the day, it's uh, uh, we need to be very concrete. Uh, and uh, and uh, and I love this concept of simplicity and uh, authenticity. There is also another concept that you use a lot in your book, which is authenticity. Well, yeah, that word has been sort of bastardized because, you know, it's used so much by inauthentic people. But <laughs> so now the word is like, I mean, there's such, the, gosh, the social media and this whole Internet and then all the politics, which is insane it was insane in italy of course a few decades ago or a decade ago whenever it was so mm -hmm. it, 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 there's just so much this ingenuous what's the word in this disingenuous is that what's the word for people who are not authentic 
and they're not uh, genuine. What? God, genuine, I'm sorry. Right? I'm genuine, really sleepy. Very genuine. I don't know if you can say that. Disingenuous is the word, but I was trying to think of it. Anyway, okay. people who are, you know, they're selling something. There's a lot of salespeople. And selling is good. Of course, there's nothing wrong with being a salesperson, but they're selling uh, nonsense. <laughs> they're selling, snake, there's a lot of snake oil uh, yeah. salesmen out there and women in politics and in whatever it, it, you name the space and so that and they are and people who preach authenticity you got to be authentic when you're out there ripping people off so uh, but i know but anyway we need a better word maybe than authentic but i do which means yeah to be your it's okay you don't have to be perfect that's one of the hallmarks of i guess authenticity is that you shouldn't be too polished it's okay to be you don't have to be like a CNN news anchor or a BBC news anchor. That doesn't feel real. But you should be n n naked in front of your audience, right? Naked, naked yes. Present, naked, right? but real. I mean, that doesn't mean, yes, you should try to get rid of the disfluencies. And, uh, 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 you know, so, yes, there are things you need to work on, of course, but people will forgive a lot of things so long as you are uh, really trying. But, um yeah, so sometimes slides would take us away from that because we're just, I don't know who you are because you're just talking to slides or you're kind of being motivated and pushed along through these slides rather than just being naked. In auth I've got to come up with a better word than authentic. But <laughs> <laughs> uh, there was this uh, amazing presentation uh, in which um, I remember there was this uh, uh, VP of marketing, whatever, uh, she needed to give a presentation to young grads. It was this audience of 400 young grads. And uh, once a month, uh, leaders were going to inspire them with these speeches. And everybody was going there and telling them how they succeeded, about their career, and how they, mm -hmm. and, and all, all these speeches were all the same. They were not inspiring at all. Uh -huh. uh, they're all stories of success, but yes. So we, um, I, I was contracted to, to support one, one, this person to, to deliver the job. And uh, what we came up with was the idea of doing exactly the opposite. We did a presentation that was uh, uh, called Utterly Beautiful or Utterly Beauty, something like that. So we, we, we made a presentation around 10 points, the 10 biggest failures in her career. And, uh, and, and, and the audience reacted in such a way, was so excited about it because at the end of the day, it was authentic. It was true. Yes. She was yeah. not just telling, um, yes, I've been successful here, I've been successful there. No, this is where I failed. Putting, putting work before family. That was the biggest mm -hmm. mistake. Don't do mm -hmm. that, guys. Mm -hmm. These kind of things. Yeah. No, you said something um, that, yeah, I totally agree. You actually, I mean, you could write a book about this. It, I, I think <laughs> it, I forget the name of the organization. It's a, in New York City, a storytelling I forget what it's called, but it's a storytelling organization. Okay. It's, you know, a nonprofit. And, um, but they had said that. There's a great quote. I have it on my website someplace. But people, it's this. The people don't care about your successes. People care about your failures. And, of course, you might, there might be a happy ending or some twist to that. But, and, and it should be authentic failures, not, you know, the guy who grew up in a rich family, but then talks about, you know, you know, yo, I grew up in the streets. Like, no, you didn't. <laughs> so if you have a real authentic origin story, that's that's great. But yeah, a general principle is to remember people don't care about your failures or their, your successes. They care about your failures. Yeah. But at the end of the day, at the end of the day, whatever it is, whether it is business, or it is a presentation, I think the keyword is trust. So, um, yeah, you can sell. Uh, you can be sneaky, you can sell uh, things that people don't really need because you make a good presentation. But at the end of the day, this is short term. Uh, then people are not stupid. So yeah, I, I, I'm amazed. I mean, I think, you know, you can see through um, nonsense or a charlatan or a con man. But I'm just amazed around the world that how I don't know what percent, but a good 30 40% of people, smart people, I mean, good people, well, sometimes there's often they're smart. I mean, even, you know, brilliant Ivy League graduates will fall for cults, you know, and weird go down rabbit holes into weird conspiracies that are demonstrative. Dem there's a word I can't, I can't speak today that are clearly not true. Uh, I'm just I don't know. It's a good 40 percent or so. I don't know what it is. I mean, humans, you know, I know we're, we are pattern seeking animals and we're easily fooled. I think it was Richard Feynman, the famous uh, physicist, who said something about, you know, the easiest person to fool is yourself. 
because as scientists, they need to be really like, is it true? That's why you have, you know, peer reviewed and I did it and I, I think the data is correct, but what do you think, you know, because it's very easy to fool yourself. Even though as a scientist, you try, you know, look, I got, I got to keep emotion out of this, but it's hard. So I guess that's why a good percentage of us are fooled by, you know, slick presenters. So I, I, uh, I definitely agree with you. I mean, plus had the fact that we get distracted so fast uh, and that we don't pay attention to many details. We just, uh, I think uh, there is a beautiful quote who was, uh, I don't remember who was saying that, but we see what we expect to see. We ignore the rest. That's true. And also, we, I would just, we just repeat things. I was thinking today, I don't know if this fact is true. This, this is not an important fact, but I was in a classroom and I said, oh, by the way, did you know? Because this woman is from Scott, half, she's like a quarter Scott or something. So I was saying that, and she's interested in Vikings. I didn't uh, Vikings come to Scotland, something like that. And I said, oh, by the way, did you know that like red cats, you know, red cats, I think they came from Norway. <laughs> I think you see if you see i think vikings brought red cats if you see red yeah, cats you know <laughs> and um i said that like i was really smart and that's a fact i just like heard that on the internet <laughs> i mean i think there was like a in reddit there was like a headline or something i don't know if that's true <laughs> but i'm taught but i'm assuming it is that's pretty silly of me to i mean that doesn't matter it's not important but i think a lot of us do that for really important things yeah but we, you know, uh, medical information, diet information, like, is that really true? Well, this yeah. study said, Harvard study said, well, yeah, I, I doubt it's from Harvard, but even if it was, so what? And you read it yeah. and it was like, no, the guy like went to a summer school in Harvard who wrote the article. <laughs> For 24 hours. <laughs> yeah, I went to Harvard. <laughs> I was there a whole afternoon. <laughs> yeah, I was there all the afternoon. I got a certificate. I, I will put it on store. my LinkedIn profile. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, uh, what's what's going to be the title of your YouTube channel? Well, I have, I mean, it's just presentations and wow. it's it's up there. I mean, if you type, put presentations and you'll see, I mean, I have my personal channel is Gar Reynolds and then there's, yeah. I think it's called presentations and video. I named it wrong. I got to just name it because, you know, it's YouTube slash, it should just be presentations and I'll have to rename that. But I haven't been very serious about it because it takes, you know, you have to have a plan to put up a video at least once a week. And I do have ideas, first off, just starting with what Presentation Zen is and what it isn't. And a mm -hmm. lot of people misunderstand what it is. One I saw recently, someone made a video. Uh, they took a, a an example of, I have a slide, uh, like bullet points. It has like six bullet points or seven bullet points. Mm -hmm. And the slide says, don't do this. It's kind of, I'm being kind of funny. Right? It's, so yeah, don't. It's Okay, don't make slides like this but the person said this is presentation zen this is how you do it keep your slides simple like this one which is like an example of how not to do it and the person made a whole video about "Ooh, look at this this is beautiful like oh man I, so it's my fault i didn't realize because humans are very visual so he just glanced at that a page have this big slide with both you know don't do that yeah, i get i get it yeah, yeah I get you know it. that is a, and because we're so visual he that must have popped out even though he didn't read it. if he read it, it would have said, don't do this. Don't do this. Yeah, but this yeah, slide he has got it seven as a best practice. <laughs> yeah, he said, oh, look how simple this is. Only seven lines of text, only seven oh, words God. per line. No, That's presentation. Really? That, that's the opposite of it. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's sort of like, you know, drinking too much is good for you. No, it's not good for you. <laughs> So it's the opposite of that. <laughs> yeah, you could make tests. But I love one thing you said. Um, you said, you said I, I must, it's my fault. I must, have under, I must have imagined that. And this is something I, of, I often tend to do. I, every time I make some slides and for some reason they do not work the way they should. I, and maybe I'm convinced they are perfect, yeah. even though it's my job. But I, the first thing I always think is, okay, if they reacted this way, uh, there must be something wrong. Um, yeah, no, it's true. It's just like in comedy. I mean, I've never been a comedian, but I used to study. I like comedians and, you know, they work out jokes in smaller venues sometimes, even famous guys. If it doesn't work, they might try it five or six. It's not working. And you think it's the funniest joke. I think Seinfeld had a movie about this. He thinks this joke, I got this joke and it's so funny. I just love it. It is not working. <laughs> no one gets it. Leave it alone. Yeah. It's not their fault. <laughs> it is it is not and uh, and i think we should uh as always it's about standing for the others um 
this is, I think, all about presentations. And I love it because it's about people. Thank you.